This meeting is being recorded. Okay. All right. So we're just, um, we are glad to be here. And I'm glad you're all here. I just love you all dearly. And I really mean that. I've been praying for each one of you over this last month. Um, as, as I felt the Holy Spirit develop this session in my heart for all of you. He also knows perfect timing for me and he was developing it for me. So um, I need to know constantly how to overcome the enemy. And that's what the title of this is, Overcoming the Lies of the Enemy and How to Defeat the Devil. So it's a bit, little bit long. I'll probably call it more How to Defeat the Devil um, because that's where it all starts from. So uh, what I want to start with tonight is, first of all, we gave testimony, Sandy gave testimony of her great um, report. And every time we give testimony, the enemy has to flee. In Revelations 12, verse 11, I'm giving you right now keys for how to destroy the enemy in your life. Right now, right from the beginning. So if you have a notepad or whatever, I really suggest you take down notes um, because you're gonna forget and you're going to think what was that or you know and i've lately for myself i've had to just i just keep this note uh, written to myself and it sits right here in my bedroom because i need to remember one tool that i'm going to talk about tonight that really helps me overcome the oppressive spirits they try to come on us a lot and we need to know how to how to battle them remember once you are possessed by god it says you are possessed by him that's in God's word. Nothing else can possess you. Two things, two entities cannot possess you. You are possessed by the heavenly father and the, the seed deposit that is within you that gives you that strength over the enemy is the Holy Spirit and he's there within you. So that right there is huge. Um, but the testimony part starts with the words, and I love it because I thought of this today. The title again is Overcoming the Lies of the Enemy. And in Revelations 12, verse 11, it says, to overcome the enemy, it is by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. To overcome the enemy. You can do it all day long with yourself. You don't need to be giving testimony to anyone else. You are giving testimony to your heavenly father above. When you give praise to him or glory to him or thanksgiving to him for anything he is doing, that is testimony and the enemy has to flee. That's why I believe when it says in God's word to be thankful in all things, because when you are thankful, he means to be thankful for God in God. And when you're thankful, then that is a testimony to him. And when it starts out with, I think I talked about this last week, by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Well, the blood of the lamb means Jesus. He was the sacrifice for us. He took everything negative on the cross. I talked about that a lot last semester. Everything, everything negative that could affect us, he took on the cross for us. So that means that you are walking in relationship with him, believing that. You, you overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb. It means, what did the blood do for you? He took our sins and he took every single negative thing from our lives. It says that he came in order that we may have life to the fullest while we're here on the planet earth. So right there, we've got to remember, give testimony to him all during the day. Um, you get a parking place. Thank you, God. Yes. If I'm looking for a birthday card, and I, I will just pray right away. God, give me the best birthday card because I just don't have time to stand there and look at 10,000 birthday cards. And I mean, the Holy Spirit, I mean, it's almost like every single time I'll just go, oh, I see that one. It's like it's highlighted because that's what the Holy Spirit does. And that's the one I have. Yeah. You need to give him glory. And then you go, thank you, God, for this awesome card. Thank you, God, for this um, great breakfast I had today. I heard a great message, and I thought this message is so powerful. She was saying, I don't even know if she was Christian or not. Well, she, yes, I believe she was, because she says, thank you, God. She said every single morning when she gets out of bed, she, she strategically places one foot on the ground and says, thank. She puts the other foot on the ground and says, you. And then she says, all the way to the bathroom, she says, I go, thank you, God. 
thank you, God. Thank you, God. She goes, in testimony that I'm alive, that I'm able to get up and be there. That's testimony. The enemy has to flee. And then she said her other conscious act that she does all day long is whenever she washes her hands, which usually we wash our hands quite a few times throughout the day, she's thankful for the water. She goes, I just thank you for the water. And she thanks God for the water. And it's just all in testimony to him. You know, when David went to slay the giant, it says that he spoke out loud. We need to speak out loud. I mean, it's hard to do it when you're a bunch of people, but I know I was talking to Lacey the other day and she was with her kids and she said, they said something and she said, thank you, God. I mean, that's testimony to yes. him. That's what we need to be doing. We need not to be shy. Just if something good happens, go, thank you, God. I mean, people hear it. It's a, you're planting a seed for one thing. But um, when David was fighting Goliath, before he fought him, he spoke out loud and he said, as you, God, were with me, when I slayed the bear and the lion, you will go before me now. He was already saying, I trust you. I thank you. So the enemy was already defeated. So when he had to sling, he had three shiny, smooth stones. He only had to throw one because he had already defeated the giant by his words. So that target and that stone were already lined up to be a victory, to be as we are more than conquerors. So that's one trick or one, I shouldn't call it a trick, a tool, <laughs> a tool, like a trick um, to overcome the enemy. Be thankful all day long. Thanking right. him, thanking him, give glory to him. Okay, let's see, I don't wanna miss anything. Um, remember also that praise, listening to Christian music is awesome especially if you get like now I've I've downloaded just a bunch of a bucket load of Christian music onto my phone and I just I, mean, I know and when I'm really feeling down turn on some music but you know the weird thing is the enemy tries to keep you from it when you know in your heart you are going into a dark spell you don't want to read God's word you do not want to turn on the happy joyful Christian music you do not want to talk to anybody who's happy and joyful. It's like the enemy does that on purpose. He knows if he can keep you isolated, he can keep the joy from you because the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. So that's your first fight instantly is when you're going into a dark place, you fight for that light. However that light can come, you fight for that light. Whether the way that you can reach it is through the music, is through reading his word, is through calling a Christian friend, whatever it is, you fight for the light because otherwise he will keep you in the darkness. So do not let him out isolate you. Remember uh, Nehemiah 8 verse 10 says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Praise and, and joy defeats the enemy. Um, I, I was, I think I shared this in an Instagram or a, maybe in a blog, I can't remember, but it was that God has continued to remind me, especially lately, because I feel like I could possibly going down, going down into a dark valley again, and we do all have those, we're not going to escape the dark valleys, but I feel like right now our boys aren't making the wisest decisions. My husband's having to look like the bad guy again. And it's almost like we're reliving what we did last year, except that I am even in a stronger place now because every trial you go through, what does it tell us? That we should be developing our perseverance and our endurance and our faith comes stronger if you're holding on to the, to Lord, the Lord's hand while you're going through the trial. If you don't hold on to his hand while you're going through the trial, you will not overcome it and you won't be developing the perseverance, the endurance, the faith. So for me last year, man, I was fighting and holding on to his hand. I mean, by, by tooth and nail, you know, it's like I, I've got to hold on to you because I just felt like it was a hard trial for me last year. And so I'm already setting myself up right now, but I am knowing even more so this year, how to stand against the enemy. And so the tools I'm telling you are because 
I am getting ready to prepare myself. You can't remember how David, he had practiced when he was taking care of his sheep out in the, in the, in the fields, in the pastures, he had practiced with his slingshot. He was good at his slingshot. He was able to kill, kill the bear and the lion. And we met up, when he met up with his greatest foe, that was this giant, he was already perfected. He was already ready. He had, was already giving testimony to God and empowered by God within him. That's what we have to be. If you start recognizing that you might be going into a trial, that you're starting to go into that inside of the valley, because you're got, it's the valley. You walk in the valley of the shadow of death. But then you come up to the mountaintop, but you got to get through the valley. And in order to do that, have your preparation ready already. Already be prepared. Already know what you need to do and start doing it ahead of time. So I'm already just going, thank you, God. You got my sons. They're yours. They're not mine anymore. They're yours. The power of prayer is the greatest thing that I can do for my sons and for our relationship. So that's what I have to do. It's not about telling anybody else. It's not trying to tell them what to do. That's the last thing they want to hear. But it's, it's giving them over to God, laying them on the altar, the way that Abraham did with Isaac, and going, I'm trusting you, God. I'm laying him here, laying them here, whatever, um, and do it. Lay your burden on the altar and just go, I'm trusting you, God. I'm trusting you, God. You got this. This is your problem. You said to cast to cast my cares. This is my greatest care right now. So what I was doing myself is when I wake up in the morning, I was starting to feel the dark cloud started to kind of trying to seep in. And I know it, I know it's the enemy. I know it with all my heart. It's like, I don't know, you just know it inside of you. It's not just a dark cloud outside. The sun is shining and I'm feeling the dark cloud. So what I do is I have learned to immediately, when I get out of bed, I text or call or email about three different people. I always pray about it first to see who the God who God brings to my heart. And I just send them an amazing, encouraging, encouraging love message. When you do that, you are... Um, sowing and you're going to reap and so when it's amazing when you do that for somebody else you immediately feel joy in your spirit but even the more the better thing is that the people respond back and they bring that joy right back upon you too so you are sowing and you're reaping joy just by those messages you send out and they're powerful I mean, because not only can they transform the person's heart that you're sending them to, but that person's response back transforms your heart. And then remember again, when you get that joy back, because it comes back to you, that joy is the joy of the Lord and it's your strength against the enemy. So that's one tool that works for me. And the interesting thing was, I'm gonna read this to you. Sorry, I feel like I'm talking fast, but I'm going to try to cram this all oh, down fine. your throats in a short amount of time. <laughs> okay, so um, yesterday I, I decided that yesterday was my day of rest. We can talk about that another time if you have questions. Day of rest, just thinking all day about God, doing things that I enjoy, loving him in everything I do, being thankful in everything I do, but not doing one thing that I consider as being work. That's what your day of rest should be. So I did that day yesterday and I got myself a really good coffee. I took the dog, went, for rock, went to the park in Healdsburg and I took one of my books. This is called The Power of Thank You by Joyce Meyer. The Power of Thank You. And I pick it up just every now and then. And for some reason, I haven't read it in quite a while. The Holy Spirit put it in my heart to take it with me. I'm sitting there, I read about three pages. This was the last page that I was going to read before I was gonna move on to my next activity. And it says, this is called gratitude, the antidote for discontentment. Discontentment though, is also always from fear. If you're discontented, it's fear about something. That's what the true root is. It's like anxiety. Um, there are so many things that the root, root is actually fear. Fear is always from the enemy. 
So I'm going to read it. Get ready. It says, a man and his sister had not been close for a while because he had moved out of the country and they rarely saw one another. The sister took care of their mother. And although he was grateful that she did, he had never expressed it to her. He decided to send her a text telling her how much she appreciated all she did. And he noticed that as soon as he hit the send button, he felt, he felt a burst of joy. His intention was to encourage his sister and add to her joy. And I'm sure he did. But the lesson is that by expressing gratitude, he received the joy himself. And Joy says, I think we can use gratitude in our heart as we would use a medicine for pain or for an illness in our bodies. Discontentment or discouragement or depression or anxiety is an illness of the soul. And when we have an attack of it, large doses of gratitude will heal it. God promises to heal our wounded souls, but this often, often requires our taking some God-inspired action. I think purposeful gratitude and giving of thanks is the antidote we need for discontentment or discouragement or depression or um, it's just amazing because it brings the joy back into your heart. And I think sometimes we forget that truly the joy of the Lord is our strength. If we need to be strong to stand against the enemy, then we need to be um, in a joy place. So that is one way that helps me try it sometime. If you're just feeling down, just send some love to somebody else. Okay, let's see. Um, I'm going to go through, I called it the devil, devil's defeated 101. Devil's defeated 101. Um, and what I wanted to do is just go through some basics about who Satan is. I don't want to talk, spend a whole lot of time on him because I really don't want to give him any glory at all. Right. But I think it's important to know a little bit about who we are fighting, where he came from, what is what he felt his purpose was, and um, what God thinks about him. So the first thing I want to do in Devil's Defeated 101, um, the quick basics, is I'm going to go over the names that are used for him in the Bible. Because I was trying to find out how many times Satan or the devil or whoever else um, under his name appears in the Bible. There were so many that I finally gave up because it was just like, he goes under so many names. But I'm just going to read off the names to you just so that you kind of can kind of get them in your brain. Um, he's called Abaddon, accuser of our brethren, the adversary, angel of the bottomless pit, Apollyon, Beelzebub, Belial, the devil, enemy, evil spirit, father of lies, great red dragon, liar, lying spirit, murderer, old serpent, power of darkness, prince of this world, Prince of Devils, Prince of the Power of the Air, Ruler of the Darkness of this World, Satan, Serpent, Spirit that Worketh in the Children of Disobedience, the Tempter, the God of this World, Unclean Spirit, and Wicked One. I mean, he goes by a whole lot of different names. Um, but as we usually call him, it's usually Satan or the devil. I mean, that's just what, what we have grown most accustomed to. But what I wanted to remind you of is one thing that I really noticed, and I think a lot of people aren't aware of, is when it tells you that he is called the prince of this world. I'm not going to read all of the scriptures, but I'm going to give these to you. If it's something you're interested in, it's John 12, verse 31. It's John 14, verse 30, and John 16, verse, le verse 11. Um, a lot of people don't realize, and they'll say, you know, why did that happen to that person? That's a good person. She loved God. I mean, why would she get taken so young? Why does this happen? Well, one reason 
that is crucial and critical is that Satan is the ruler over this world. And we don't like to think that, but that's what it tells us. It tells us that in God's word. It says that if we are of this world, we are of the ruler of this world, who is Satan. So we have to choose to be aliens. And it talks about this in God's word also. We are aliens in this world because this is not, he is not our Lord. He is not our ruler. He is not our prince. We are just living here for a temporary time. Our place where we consider home is actually in heaven. So, but, so bad things do happen, but it's not because God did it. It's because Satan is the ruler of this world. And it's by our own flesh that things happen. It's also because of our own choices, oftentimes, that things happen. We'll go, well, why did that happen to her? Well, I mean, I've heard, I remember one thing happening that if she had been in a terrible car accident, she was an amazing, godly Christian person, but she had been drinking and she was in a car accident. I mean, and that was her choice. And yet the consequence came. But we have to just realize that the one reason that is a great reason why we want to leave this planet is because we're not going to have to put up with any of this anymore. I mean, this is not the perfect place for us because the perfect place for us is when we are going to be able to go to heaven. So that's what we look toward. And that's what we're supposed to look toward. We really are supposed to consider this as such a short stomping ground, really for what lies ahead of us, which is our forever. So we, we, we are gonna go through trials. And again, it says, uh, actually I wrote it down. Where did I read it? Um, oh, I'll come across it. But it is the one that it says that uh, we are going to have trials and tribula tribulations while we were on this earth. But I, Jesus, cheer up, cheer up, he says, because I, Jesus, have overcome the world. That means he's overcome the enemy. And it means that we can be cheerful in the midst of this chaos and junk that's going on around us because we know who we are and we know where we're going to be and we know who loves us and we know he has an incredible plan for us. So we can think cheer up in the middle of whatever we're going through. So let's say I wanted to read... The next part here that I've got about him. I was trying to find the briefest. I didn't want to read a ton of scriptures. So I'm just going to read this overall commentary that I felt was really good. It says the two scripture passages that describe Satan before he fell. That means before he was cast from he heaven are Ezekiel 28 verse 12 through 19 and Isaiah 14 verse 12 through 15. Satan was the anointed cherub. He was like the head angel. Ezekiel 28, verse 14. He was adorned with every precious jewel imaginable. That's Ezekiel 28, verse 13. Now these, I'm giving you very short. If you go to these scriptures, there's gonna to be long um, explanations. He was the model of perfection full of wisdom and perfect in beauty, Ezekiel 28, verse 12. Likely, he was the highest of all angels. He was persuasive enough to convince one third of the angels to join him in his rebellion, Revelations 12, verse four. Even after his fall from heaven, not even Michael, the archangel, dared to stand up to him without the Lord's help, Jude 9. Satan fell because of pride. He did not like being second best. He wanted to be God. He said in his heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. And when he decided to try to raise himself above God himself, that's when God put him down and he was cast unto the earth. But um, uh, what was I going to say about that? Oh, but it's interesting. So I was listening, I read some more of these. I was reading the longer explanations. 
it said that um, um, Satan, or actually he was called Lucifer when he was living in heaven. Um, he, okay, anyway, I just lost my train of thought again. Oh, he was created. So it says God created him. And I found that interesting. So I prayed about it. And what I feel like is truth is that God created him. He was beautiful. He was supposed to be musical. There are supposedly, um, I couldn't find it, but some scriptures that say his body was actually made out of musical instruments. And they feel that he was probably the leader of worship in the heavens. Um, but he had, he could make choice. He had choice. He chose to try to exalt himself above God. And see, exactly as we all have choice, we have choice to either choose Christ as our Lord and Savior, or we can choose some other religion, or choose to be atheist, or agnostic, or whatever. We have choice. So God's creatures have choice. And that was kind of fascinating to me. He created Satan. He created, God created his angels, God's angels, but he gave them choice and a third of them chose to follow Satan. So a third of them are here on the earth doing what Satan does, which is to be demonic. So that's who is coming against us. And a third of the angels, I can't even imagine of all of heaven, there's, can you imagine how many, I don't know what the number is, or if it tells us that somewhere in the Bible, but there's a lot, there's a lot of them. But the great thing that we have to remember is that he, the Holy Spirit within us, is greater than he, Satan, and all of his little minions in the world. Holy Spirit is greater. And you are possessed by the deposit of the Holy Spirit by God. So you are already above him. You're already above him. So whenever you start to feel that battle coming on or that trial coming on or that attack in your mind, you have to choose to remember who you are. It tells us in Colossians 3, you have to set your mind on the things above. You have to set your mind. Right then you have to go, I'm not going there. I don't care, Satan, what you're trying to put in my mind. I don't believe it. I'm not believing it. I'm not going down that rabbit trail. And I thank you, God, that you within me is greater than him and he has to go. By the name of Jesus, it says Jesus gave us the authority to stand against him and use Jesus' name because Satan has to bow under the name of Jesus. So if you're in a place where you don't even know what else to do and you don't know how to pray, sometimes you feel like you don't know how to pray. Just say Jesus. Just say Jesus and believe him in your heart. Believe that his presence is there and his presence is there. And he within you will be that conqueror that you need to have and that you need to hear and that you need to just believe in with yes. all your heart. So um, again, just a reminder of who that Holy Spirit is within you. Remember, he's everything you need. We did the four C's and then as his, he's your comforter, he's your counselor, he's your convincer, he's your convictor, he's your advocate, your standby, your helper, your intercessor, and your strengthener. He is everything. And then it says, and then he will bring back to your remembrance anything you need at the time you need it. That's what he is to you. So he, and he's within you. So you got it all. So you just got to keep on thinking, I got it all. The enemy might be trying to be, get right in here where Joyce says the battlefield is of the mind. But the Holy Spirit has all of you. So you just need to stand up in who you are and rise up. And as 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3, 4, and 5, take every thought captive that is not of God and just put it at Jesus' feet. But you have to do it right away because his little darts are just coming so fast and you just have to be ahead of him and above him and realizing who you are because of, because of Holy Spirit. 
So take every thought captive. Don't let it start stirring around. Don't let it start getting embedded because then it can work its way down into your spirit. And that's when you really can be overcome with depression or fear or anxiety. And I know because I'm, I'm speaking from a place where I've been to and been from. And so I am, I am determined to be prepared that when I go into these valleys, I am more than a conqueror. I am more than a conqueror. And I can be cheerful in the midst of it because I know the battle's already been won. It says in Romans 5, triumph over your trials. It it's telling us, it's speaking, triumph over your trials. You have to choose. I am going to, I'm, I've already beat this because Jesus has already beat this. So it's my victory through Jesus, but it's already done. So you triumph over your trials. All right, let's see where I'm at here. Um, it says, I'm not going to read all of these scriptures, but in Revelations 12, verse 7 through 9, we hear of how Satan was actually cast down from, he from heaven. If you want to go there, take a look at that. Um, but then in Revelations 12, verse 17, it says that now Satan, now being us now in the present he is waging war on all of those who are believing in the christ child as lord so it tells us he's not waging against those who don't care or are of other religions he's waging against us waging war against us so that just gives you more of a reason to be um determined to have all of the tools all of the armor all of what you need to stand up against him because he's not caring about anyone else. He's caring about you. And it's easy to go, well, what if I don't do anything? If I don't tell anyone about God, if I don't go to church, if nobody knows I'm a Christian, then maybe he'll just kind of leave me alone. To be honest, he will leave you alone. If you are of no purpose to God's kingdom, he really could care less about you. He will still, you'll be one of those that are going to be the last that he's going to work on. But he's working on the ones that are out there doing what they're supposed to be doing, which is serving God's purpose on their earth. He tells us in Ephesians 2 that God provides works for us to do. We don't gain heaven by doing the works, but we are raised to different levels of faith when we do the works. So we want to get out there and do the things that God puts on our hearts to do. We want to share God's word. We want to deposit the seeds of salvation in people's hearts. Because as we do so, we are just stronger in who we are. And he needs us. He needs us to be the strong people that he has created us to be. And he's not going to put anything in your heart that he's not going to equip you to do. And he's never going to allow more on you than what you are capable of going through. And that's always kind of a hard scripture, but I've thought about that a lot. Even going through the trials with my sons, I would sometimes say, God, why me? I mean, I tried to raise them up in you, God. I took them to church, I took them to youth group. I did all these things, why me? Why my right. sons? Why are they going sideways? Right. But he allowed it because he knows that I'm capable of handling it. And he also has the promise that anything that the enemy plans for evil, he will turn for good. But we have to follow through in the plan in order that that is accomplished. So if you're going through a trial, just go, I'm in it because you've allowed me, because you know my faith is going to get bigger when I'm through it. And I'm going to be stronger and I'm going to be more than the conqueror because of what I'm going through. And it's, it's, and it's tough. And I know it. I, I know it with all my heart. Um, James one, when it says, consider it pure joy, when we go through trials of any kinds, because in doing so, you're going to be developed. You're going to be stronger. You're going to be the person that God can use. And as you are the person that God wants to use, you will feel such a joy inside because the closer that you become like Christ, when Christ tells us that we are supposed to be imitators of him, the closer that you become, begin to imitate him, 
the more joy, the more strength, the more love you have because you're imitating him. I mean, that's huge and it's strength and it's faith and it's everything that starts will come upon you as you walk in it and choose to do what you need to do in the middle of your trials. So, okay, let's see if there's anything else. Um, I just wanted to say real quick, the first appearance um, that we heard of Satan <clears throat> was when he talked to Eve and we all know that story. He talked to her, he approached her as a serpent or something that looked like a snake. A snake is low to the ground. It looks, I mean, if you were in the garden living with all these huge beasts like Adam and Eve were, and there's a snake, that'd probably be the last thing that you'd be worried about. I mean, he came as a subtle, sneaky, low to the ground, humble. He wanted to look humble and like, oh, certainly you can listen to me. I'm just a lowly serpent on the ground. And she was drawn into his lies. And she listened to him. And then she took what he said and spoke it into Adam, right? And then Adam bit the apple or the fruit. But what, what we have to take from there and realize is that he's doing the same thing to us. He talks to us. He talked to Eve. He talks to us in our minds. You, you can't say, oh, no, I just don't believe that. I'm sorry. If you believe God's word then you have to understand he does do that. So he's speaking in your mind, just as God speaks in our minds, in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, because God now that we don't get to walk with him in the garden the way we did with Adam and Eve, where they heard his voice all the time, where I believe they probably saw him as some type of vision. Um, we don't have that anymore, but it's the same thing with Satan. We don't see him physically anymore. Yes. He's right there and he's being active. But the thing that he does and he loves to do is he's very subtle. If he can get you to do, to believe something in your mind to where you're actually going to speak it out loud to affect someone else or a group of others, that's his greatest joy and his greatest, I think, uh, what do you call it? A conquest. Because that's what he did with Eve. And that's what he does with us. Like sometimes we're in a group of people. Maybe you're talking. Maybe you know something really interesting. The enemy will remind you, oh, remember that good juicy piece of gossip that you could really add right now into that story? He's doing that all the time in different circumstances in our lives. Because if he can drag us down, he'd much rather use us to drag others down. And that's what he does. So you have to be prepared for that too. Don't let him use you like a puppet because that's exactly what he did with Eve. Um, all right, let me see. Da, da, da. Okay, so I'm gonna get ready to close here. What I wanna close on is one of the greatest scriptures that really has changed my heart, um, made me think about how, whether I'm really standing against the enemy or not. Because when we look at God's word and how we're gonna go through this season, of this class is really finding scriptures that tell us exactly how to stand against the enemy. And one of the greatest ones is James 4, verse 7, where it says, <laughs> resist the devil and he will flee. But everyone almost always has heard that, but for some reason they've left off the most important part. Submit to God resist the devil and he will flee you have to submit to god whatever's been entangling you and keeping you in sin that's the greatest thing that you can work on to give up to god to submit it to god because in doing so you have resisted the enemy's temptation to keep doing it and the enemy has to flee once you choose that I am giving this over to God, it is no longer going to hold me captive. That's when the enemy loses all his power over you in that area. He will come back and work in other areas. But I'm starting just from the beginning, from maybe your greatest area, your greatest sin. So what I, what I saw last week, and this was so amazing to me, and I can't, I'm not going to explain to you all the details of how I got here, but I was reading 
Hebrews 12, verse 11. It's hiding. Hold on, I'll get it. Hebrew, there it was. Hebrews 12, verse 11. Um, not Hebrews 12, Hebrews 12, verse 1. And I'm going to start with the second sentence. Let us strip off and throw aside every encumbrance, every unnecessary weight, and that sin which so readily deftly and cleverly clings to and entangles us and let us run with patient endurance and steady and active persistence the appointed course of the race that is set before us now that race is always talking about going forward in our desires to be what god wants us to be on this earth is the race the sin that readily entangles us is what attracted me when i read this scripture i'm like what the heck is the sin that readily entangles us? I'm like, is it, is it one sin that, that we all are affected by? So I started reading commentaries. No, it's your sin. Your one sin that can catch you the easiest. That's where Satan works the most. And so for me, so I prayed about this. I was like, oh my gosh, what is the sin that entangles me? And it's anxiety. Anxiety, worry is sin. It's sin. And so I instantly know, okay, that's the one that entangles me. That's the one that says to fight against the sin that entangles you. And so when it says submit to God, I have got to submit that one, that one that is my greatest entanglement, because that's the one the enemy will use the most. That's the one he tempts you into. I wrote down different things that that could be. It could be worry. It could be fearful, um, fearing. It could be swearing. Like maybe you just get with friends and that's what you do. Or you start to get mad about something. It just starts to come out when normally you don't. It's the temptation of the enemy. Lying, drinking. Maybe God has spoken into you and said, quit drinking or don't drink that much. Or gossip. All of these are sin that can get us entangled. So what we have to do and what I want you to do is think about this week. What is the sin that entangles you? What is the one thing? Okay, I know for a fact that mine is allowing anxiety that has to do with my family or my sons. That's my greatest entanglement. And I know now because I've really been thinking about it and reading it, that it is a sin. It's a sin for me to not trust God. To allow worry into my heart means that I'm not trusting God. So that's where I'm going to start. I'm going to start right there. And that's the one that I'm going to work at. That's the one that every morning I'm going to pray to God. It says, bring your request before God. Psalm 5. Bring your request before God in the morning and expect his answer. Every morning, I want to take, I want you to take that sin that so easily entangles you before God, right in the morning. Just say, God, I release this anxiety from you. This is not of you. This is sin. I confess it for what it is. I plead the blood of Jesus over it, over myself. And I thank you, God, that I will walk in submission to you. I will not allow it because of who you are within me. And as I submit to you, the enemy has to flee. Choose your own way of how you want to say it. But the greatest thing I think where you could start is doing that every morning. Just thinking about it, pray about it. Every one of us has one sin that we are easily tempted into. And it's so subtle because the enemy wants to keep us deceived. So just really ask the Holy Spirit, just go, what is it? What is it, Holy Spirit, that I need to submit to God so I can be free of it so that the enemy doesn't have any more authority over me in that area of my life? Because that's what we all want. And then from that place of triumph, then we'll, we'll go into next week. So, so dear Father, I just pray for this person here. 
I pray, God, that you have spoken yes. to their hearts. You have left a deposit of your word. Yes, Lord. Holy Spirit, that you would bring it back up to them every day to remind them, what is that sin that so easily entangles me? What is it, Lord God, that this morning, right now, I submit it to you. I submit it to you, trusting God that the enemy has to flee. As I resist him, as I submit and resist, the enemy has to flee. So, Lord, I thank you for this. I thank you for this message. I thank you that you speak to all these beautiful, sweet women, Lord yes, God. Lord, that you, you protect them. You protect their families. Protect yes, them. Lord. And that, Lord, we hear you every day. We don't miss your voice. We hear your voice. And we thank you. We thank you for who you are and all you've done for us. In Jesus' precious name, amen. 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 Thank you, so oh, You're welcome. I had so much more. That was the <laughs> <laughs> Oh, gosh. Anyway, I, I just you. really believe this is important. So really ask, where, where do I get entangled? Where is the holy, where is Satan just waiting to jump in? Because he knows that's your weak spot. So pay attention to it and just submit it to God. And just keep Amen. Yep. All right. All right. Thank you, Sally. I love you all. Thank you. Have a good week. Thank you. Okay. Have a good love week. you a bunch. Good Bye. to see you, Marcella. <laughs> Goodbye, you guys. Bye. Thank you, Le or <laughs> I'm gonna call you Lacey. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> Thank was, you. Sorry, I was like in and out, but I was multitasking. <laughs> oh, that's okay. I'm glad you're yeah. here. Multitasking. Yeah, I listened to the whole thing. It was awesome. Nice job. Excellent. Oh, thank, yeah, thank good you. one. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Yes. Thank you, Very God. Happy. Thank you, Shannon. All, All right. right. Have a good Love week. You. Okay, you too. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye, Sandy. Bye.